So, Mandeep, so you, you've been involved in this field a long time. And I always wonder, how does somebody get involved in transplantation? Tell us your initial experiences and why you got involved in transplantation in the first place. You may be surprised by the answer, Jim. Uh, uh, I don't have a story where I was born to do heart transplantation. I was thrown out of the cath lab in, um, uh, during my fellowship because I was uh, uh, deemed to be a bit of a maverick uh, fellow. I didn't know where else to go. So I found that to train in uh, completing my catheterization training, the only people who were doing their own angiography and right heart catheterization were the heart failure and transplant group in New Orleans. So I said, boy, I, I, I need to uh, graduate as a, uh, as a cardiologist. And so I reached out to them. And they were very kind enough to take me on. That was my first introduction to heart transplantation. Well, the love was instantaneous. It didn't take me but a week of being uh, exposed to these patients that I realized that, my God, somehow uh, my life had steered me in the right direction. So I don't have a great story to tell of great inspiration, but I was uh, led into the field very much by accident. But there is one other thing I'll tell you, Jim. Um, my birthday is uh, what connects me to the field. And uh, I was born on the day the first uh, heart transplant was performed by Sir Christian Barnard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting that in those early days, the, the field was dominated by cardiac surgeons. Yes. And the evolution has taken us to a different area, a different era in which cardiologists really are the mainstay of cardiac transplantation and really of mechanical support too. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about that evolutionary process away from the cardiac surgeon toward the cardiologist and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, I don't think that uh, the field has moved away from the cardiac surgeon I, at all. I think that the field is here today because of the cardiac surgeon, because um, the cardiac surgeon is a phenotype where they do not accept no for an answer. And we in cardiovascular medicine often do. We are moderates. Now, over time, when the field moved into its expanded state, what happened was that it became very clear that the population of patients from which uh, heart transplantation was but a treatment was expanding to a level where for every 10 patients we encountered, only one was suitable or eventually needed a heart transplant or ended up requiring a mechanical circulatory support device. As a result of which, um, uh, cardiovascular specialists were forced to care uh, for these patients over years and years and years. And most practices accumulated a large number of these patients to draw from. And I think that was one of the first uh, shifts towards a cardiovascular medicine-based uh, programmatic approach. I don't think that uh, surgeons and, and you are uh, one of the uh, top flight surgeons of our era. I don't think you would have wanted to take care of 1,500 heart failure patients uh, in order to execute uh, on uh, doing 40 to 50 heart transplants. So let's talk about ISHLT for a bit. Sure. Tell us about why you gravitated toward ISHLT. What were your, some of your earlier experiences with ISHLT? My, um, my entry into ISHLT was based on uh, some of the early research work uh, that uh, I began to be involved in. And very early in my fellowship, I realized that uh, we had reached a point where we were performing heart transplants with reasonable success uh, out to the first year. Uh, but uh, I was beginning to see this uh, group of patients coming in again and again uh, with the late complications. And my initial clinical research work began to focus on cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Around the time back in the mid-90s uh, when I was still training, uh, we uh, had access to two early tools. The first was intravascular ultrasonography, which had just developed. And the second was uh, the creation of the um, uh, in vivo angioscope. And we had just developed some of that technology at that point of time. 
And I was uh, very intrigued uh, in trying to understand the early natural history of uh, cardiac allograft vasculopathy. So we were one of the first uh, groups in the country uh, and around the world, actually, in New Orleans to perform intravascular ultrasonography. Stanford had just begun to uh, perform the same uh, technique at that time. And as we began to look at uh, the coronaries of uh, these patients, in, uh, in terms of in describing the natural history of the disease, very early on, we would uh, perform um, intravascular ultrasound at the first year time point, it became very clear to us that this disease was rather unique. It developed very quickly, even in young hearts, and that we needed to create an entire technique-based uh, evolution to understand the disease. So as we got into that field is when um, I was introduced to the ISHLT, because naturally the ISHLT had evolved into being the scientific forum for the uh, discussion around most of these issues. And I remember as a first year fellow in cardiovascular medicine uh, uh, that uh, I had just completed the first study of intravascular ultrasonography in these patients and, and uh, submitted a, uh, a paper to ISHLT and lo and behold, it got accepted for an oral presentation. And my goodness, uh, Jim, I was thrilled. I was on top of the world. I said, oh my God, how am I going to do this now? And my first meeting at ISHLT was the Venice meeting, um, a beautiful place. Uh, and at that point, I was so struck by the immense collegiality of this group. It was uh, amazing uh, to see surgeons, physicians, uh, just um, in, in a collegial environment, Jim, where uh, we all knew the uncertainty of what we were doing. And everyone came together to evolve in this very anecdotal manner to evolve the field forward. So that was my first exposure to ICHLT. So let's, let's talk about that some more, because one of the challenges today, of course, is to encourage young people to join this society as yep. opposed to focusing their efforts, the SDS if they're a surgeon, yep. American Heart Association, yep. Heart Failure Society of America. And you've had involvement in all of those as of I. So help us understand why one should focus their energy in this society as opposed to others. I think uh, other societies are great. Uh, one needs to um, uh, be a part of um, many societies uh, so that one can experience uh, different uh, stages of, um, of their career evolution. The ISHLT is unique, and I, I'll tell you, Jim, that from my standpoint, the most unique thing about ISHLT is that it is the only society in our field that can help transform careers. Other societies are there for the learning of knowledge. If you are a part of ISHLT, it is a society that helps your career evolve forward. I can, in fact, look back at the last 15 years of my involvement with the society, and I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt what uh, are the time points where the society helped me grow as a physician scientist. Not a question about that. So having said that, there still are a lot of challenges because our society is growing, yes. but yet there is a lot of pressure for people to go to fewer meetings so that when we have a diverse group of infectious disease and cardiology and surgery who may have a major allegiance to a society just restricted to their field of endeavor rather than, rather than the scientific mm -hmm. base of knowledge mm -hmm. and advanced heart failure, mm -hmm. What do you think are the challenges? What do you think are the areas of vulnerability of the society in the future that we have to be watchful yeah. for? Yeah, and I think uh, this is a conversation we've had collectively for the last many years. And uh, we have already uh, adapted to the challenges about uh, back in 2008 uh, when we launched our first comprehensive strategic plan. Uh, I think that 2008 was a defining year in the future of ISHLT. Its um, greatness, its evolution, its strength um, is um, uh, when one looks back historically at the society, you will see that that was one of the inflection points for the society. Why? Well, uh, the simple change that occurred in 2008 was that the collective senior leadership of ISHLT 
decided that instead of being a top-down organization, ISHLT needed to move from a bottom-up organization. And it led to the complete change, and you, of course, were instrumental in, uh, in uh, shepherding much of that change, Jim, uh, led to a major shift where we launched incredible opportunities for everyone in the membership to become greatly uh, involved. And we took away the onus of uh, senior leadership directed activity down. We stopped the issue uh, where the senior leadership was actually micromanaging the society. And uh, we went to more of a reactionary mode at the senior leadership uh, uh, standpoint, whereas we allowed the base, uh, the grassroots level of the society to evolve into an action-based um, uh, membership. So I think that was uh, one of the big uh, shifts. The second uh, thing that I can um, uh, put my finger on is the fact that we embraced a very diverse portfolio. We were not narrow-minded to say, hey, uh, uh, we call ourselves the ISHLT, and the T is for transplantation. We recognized very quickly that if we had to survive in the future landscape, we needed to become fiduciaries of the disease process, not just the therapy. And I think uh, when one thinks in that uh, regard, we have now uh, slowly but surely transformed ourselves into an advanced cardiopulmonary disease eradication and therapy society. Um, certainly that, to me, is one of the reasons why we are able to embrace uh, diverse groups of people like infectious disease specialists, congenital heart disease specialists, our colleagues uh, that uh, have uh, lived in the pulmonary world, in pulmonary arterial hypertension and right heart failure. This has now become the society for that group. This is now the society for mechanical circulatory support. Uh, this uh, is the society and always will be the society for international advocacy and learning in heart and lung transplantation, but I think that we are moving towards transforming the ISHLT into an international global society whose primary job is to eradicate advanced heart and lung disease with the idea of uh, decreasing practice variations throughout the world in the advanced therapies and with the idea of decreasing global inequity. So. If somebody were looking back at this interview 10 years from now, mm -hmm. and they had made some mistakes in the society, mm -hmm. if you were going to warn them, what mistakes do you want to avoid in this society, <laughs> what would you advise them? How much time do we have? Um, uh, without making a mistake, you cannot evolve to the next stage. It's, it's a sine qua non. I think uh, surgeons appreciate that better than cardiologists. Uh, those who are the most uh, risk takers appreciate that. I think there are many mistakes that uh, one could have made. Uh, one of the fortunate things with the ISHLT and 10 years from now, whoever is uh, reading or looking at this interview will, uh, will be looking at the society as a very different society. It will be a society with three times the current membership, three times. I think that we have restricted our membership at this point in time. It is time that we as a collective uh, group said, this is not a society that should be a society for just 3,000 people. This is a society that should be a society for tens of thousands of uh, professionals in the field. And I think that uh, we are moving slowly towards that, Jim. Sometimes we tend to uh, take action into our hands at a senior uh, leadership level. And I think that we have to allow certain things to grow organically at the base. Uh, our, we, we sometimes exercise impatience that uh, we're turning the um, uh, group over to the young uh, folks and that they're just not like us. And we get frustrated by that sometimes. But it's not true. They're actually smarter than we are. <laughs> they sometimes take their own time. We have to exercise patience. It's really, Jim, it's like parenting is uh, the way I look at it. And parents make mistakes all the time. So is there a danger of the society becoming too big? I don't think so. I think that this field is becoming big. I think as people with heart disease are, and lung disease are living longer and longer, 
uh, there is a much greater need for um, uh, this society. There is a much greater need for this society to transform itself into um, a global mission. We have a mission statement, but we have restricted ourselves more from a therapy standpoint uh, in very narrow areas. I think it's time that the ISHLT changed its uh, mission uh, to the eradication of advanced heart and lung disease worldwide. People have spoken favorably and really affectionately about ISHLT being sort of a family. Yes. And that's been one of the things that has drawn them here, even though it doesn't speak to maybe 80% of their daily activities if they're a cardiologist or a surgeon. Yes. How do we combine and balance getting bigger yep. and maintaining family? Yeah. So what, what is the difference between uh, just cohabiting versus a family? It's, it's that you grow together. You take care of each other's needs. You are always looking out for each other. You respect and are loyal to your elders. Your elders look after you. They take care of you in um, downturns, they take, and they celebrate your uh, victories. I think the society has that. It's in its DNA. And the leadership in each year has to be careful not to get uh, away from that. I think there is a danger. You can get too big. And, and it is incumbent upon the senior leadership to not allow that to happen. But I think uh, growing to uh, tens of thousands of uh, members uh, should not uh, take away from the core philosophy of uh, the ISHLT being a career building opportunity, one that takes care of its young. And I think that's the message that we must continuously uh, push forward. So let's talk about your presidency. Yeah. So you were president during a time of economic challenge to the society. Yes. There was in a little bit of economic trouble. Yes. Uh, help us understand some of the special challenges that you faced during your presidency and, and, and some of the initiatives. Yes. Um, I think that um, uh, as I look back at the 2007 to 2009 time frame, it was an extremely challenging time for the society. Um, economically, yes, we were seeing a pullback from support and funding from our partners. Uh, we were seeing a economic downturn globally. It was the uh, year of the uh, recession back in uh, uh, 2008. All of a sudden, uh, one day, we found ourselves unable to execute many of the core missions that we uh, needed to. Um, this society's structure is what uh, changed and helped it weather that storm. What was that about the structure? Everyone came together. Yes, that's easy. But the beauty of the society during that time was the ability to get a truly international opinion and diversity of thought and diversity of leadership at a time. This wasn't a US problem. It wasn't a European problem. It wasn't an Australian problem. For us, it was a global problem. And everyone came together to do that. One of the key things uh, that we did around that time point was that we moved to diversify the portfolio of the society in terms of embracing uh, the disease structure as a whole. Uh, we uh, made sure that we uh, moved and began to embrace our colleagues in the right heart failure world, the pulmonary uh, hypertension world. That was a singularly important um, uh, direction that the society took. And now I'm so gratified to see that this society has become one of the premier venues of where pulmonary hypertension related therapy is uh, discussed. Uh, it's a extraordinary, uh, extraordinary progress. So the journal, why did you want to become an editor of a, of a, <laughs> of a journal? Yes, um, there, there are two ways to influence uh, the field. One is to influence the field by investigational activity and to help promulgate the knowledge base. The second is to become the judge of the knowledge base and moving the scientific voice of the field forward to transform the field. The first one is done by being a uh, physician scientist. The second one is done by being a journal editor. I had no question in my mind that what, that was one of the most important roles that I wanted to play uh, in my career a trajectory with the ISHLT. I was taking a lesson from you, Jim. I basically took over the journal from you after you uh, completed your tenure. 
uh, and you can probably speak to the uh, very gratifying time that you had as a journal editor. I'm still young in that, um, uh, in that phase, but I can tell you that it's been fantastic uh, for me to be able to help define the way the knowledge evolves in the field. I can tell you it's been fantastic for me to be able to create conduits of uh, expression of our scientific voice in different ways. It's been fantastic for me to involve young, talented people who are clamoring. They, they, they wonder, how are we going to get our thoughts out there? And uh, a journal, and the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant in particular, has now become the vehicle to help uh, our young people be mentored into the scientific exercise. Writing an expression of, uh, of science is as important as, as conducting the science. Because if you cannot articulate what you've done in a very clear way, and you cannot reach the intended audience, and you, you, you cannot really make a difference. You know, we all compete, and competition is very, very healthy. Yes. And you have been instrumental in, in competing successfully against other journals and getting a very, very favorable impact factor. And some people, uh, including myself, have, have historically chosen to support that journal. But not everybody does. Yes. And there are uh, many people that are, um, have the opinion, correctly or incorrectly, that there might be more prestige in the New England Journal of Medicine or Circulation or the uh, Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. How do you, on a day-to-day -day or on a philosophical note, how do you deal with that? How do you try to convince people that really this is the best place for them to put their work, even if they could easily put it elsewhere? Jim, I think actions speak louder than words. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to create a credibility story uh, for people. Uh, it's not just about an impact factor. It's going to be hard to compete with journals that have been in existence for hundreds of years. And that's, uh, that's where journals like the New England Journal or Lancet come in. They also have the ability to take on a much larger uh, scope of uh, work. And so the opportunities to grow their impact factor are greater. The Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation is a niche journal. Uh, it is um, gratifying that we've made some very, very uh, targeted changes to the journal, and those have all resulted in an enhanced credibility. It's not just about supporting the journal. Uh, we are always grateful to people like yourself who have um, helped uh, really steer the journal and have, uh, have been uh, doggedly uh, supportive of making sure that some of the best mechanical circulatory support work um, uh, always falls into the repository base of the journal. That is clearly one way that we have been able to move the journal forward. But the other way that we've done that is by making sure that we provide a very effective uh, author or investigator interface. So we have uh, made sure that we are very responsive uh, to the authors. We've made sure that uh, they uh, have the readership that they deserve. We've made sure that, um, that their work is immediately commented upon uh, by senior leaders of this field through editorials or perspective pieces. So that the entire issue of the journal now is a much more um, uh, proactive uh, issue where people uh, feel that the credibility of the journal has grown. Now, y y you know, it's no accident that we now enjoy the number one rank uh, in the scientific publishing space amongst all solid organ transplant niche specific journals. It's no accident that the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant is now ranked in the top five in any surgical journal or in any respiratory journal or in the top 10 percentile of all cardiovascular journals. So we've been extremely fortunate uh, to, to have been able to amplify the journal's credibility and its standing on the uh, foundational work of what you did and what uh, the editors before you have done. So is the journal big enough? In other words, one of the real challenges uh, in terms of sensitivity is that because of the influx of manuscripts, the acceptance rate is much lower. Yes. And yet there are still very good articles that are not getting published in the journal. Yes. So what do you see as options for that? Uh, 
Another spin-off journal like the uh, American Association of Thoracic Surgery yeah. did, what Circulation did, increasing the size of the journal with more funding. Yeah. What, what are the options? I think that the uh, journal um, should um, stay as credible and as competitive as possible. And so the natural, um, a natural solution to something like this is to say, fine, uh, that's what happens. Uh, when, when journals grow in size, um, the New England Journal of Medicine has not uh, launched a baby uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it's really tough, tough, tough to get a paper into the New England Journal of Medicine, yet uh, people always send their papers to the New England Journal of Medicine. And I think that uh, what uh, an increased quality of the main journal, uh, such as the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant in our field does, is that it forces uh, the creation of better science in the field. And I think this is something that we cannot really calculate. It becomes organic over time. People know that in order to get a paper into the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant today, they have to have precision in their science. They have to have accuracy. It has to be of the highest caliber. And I think that that helps indirectly to grow the field. Now, the challenge is that sometimes there are young, um, uh, emerging, uh, rising stars who need another forum. And we do, as a society, need to think of other avenues uh, to help uh, create that dialogue. It could be as simple as allowing for the creation of an electronic-only uh, journal, a small mini-journal with a different scope, perhaps oriented towards techniques, to, towards clinical uh, outcomes and uh, treatment uh, paradigms, towards um, case-based um, uh, discussions. And I think we are going through that exercise right now, Jim, to see where we should uh, take these thoughts. What about the <clears throat> movement of the society uh, into advocacy for undeveloped countries? Yes. Um, what's your view about the importance of that and the overall mission of the society? I think it is uh, one of the most critical facets um, uh, for the ISHLT. The ISHLT, following the implementation of our new strategic plan, has developed uh, some uh, very mature committee structures at a variety of levels, which we didn't have five years ago. So we now have a, a very uh, well uh, thought out, strategically oriented education committee. We now have uh, I2C2, which is our advocacy committee. We have the standards and guidelines committee. We have our registry uh, uh, committee and group that, uh, that is already penetrating into these areas that we think we should be doing active outreach. My feeling is that ISHLT needs to really amplify the I in the ISHLT, which is the international thing, not just by feeling secure that we represent any country that wishes to come to us, but by globally exercising an outreach in advocacy and in learning and in leadership development. I think we need an ambassador program. I think we need a program where we identify regional leaders who will be regional educators, who will be trained by uh, the ISHLT, who will be uh, affiliated with the advocacy groups here, who will be affiliated with the registry groups, those who have political influence in their own countries. I think the ISHLT must now move into creating its landscape way beyond what we've done. This ISHLT should not just be a North American, Australian, UK, uh, European uh, society. I think we need to move uh, more actively into Latin America. I think we need to move more actively into the Middle East. I think we need to move more actively into South uh, Asia. I think we need to move more actively into the Far East and Russia. So that's a lot of additional manpower that would be needed to uh, carry out those missions. So. One of the things that I reflect on is that there are three types of past presidents. So if you look at the past presidents of the society, they're, uh, they're a very impressive array of individuals professionally yes. and personally. Yes. Some of them see the difficulties of transplantation, mm -hmm. uh, the rigors of getting the work done, whether it be in the middle of the night or, or, or at other times, and they move on. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they perform brilliantly in the society and then they choose some different pathway and that's fine. Then there's a smaller subset that continues to be active in the society, uh, finds fulfillment. But then there's a big middle group mm -hmm. who are available yet rarely called upon. 
come to meetings, but their, their continued expertise is somehow not tapped into. Mm -hmm. How could we take advantage of that? Well, I think in two ways. One is that our senior leaders uh, must use our uh, past leaders um, as advisors. I think that, um, that we must learn from them. Uh, just as you asked, uh, you know, if someone looks at this uh, interview 10 years from now, um, you know, what are the central mistakes that they should avoid? Uh, hopefully they will have avoided them. But I think that uh, they should be used as a sounding board. But this is also a society that doesn't necessarily wait to call on someone. And I think that it is erroneous to think that uh, our past leaders uh, uh, have uh, completed their task of being president um, or in other fiduciary responsibilities of leadership in the society, and they should just now wait to be called on. I think that's wrong. I think that they should, uh, should be looking at the field and should remain engaged in the society and, in fact, come forward and push the senior leadership to move, for, move forward in different venues um, if they feel that the society's direction is not moving in that regard. So I think that it has to go both ways, Jim. Some societies, you know, uh, call upon them in, in, in ways of, of involving them more in committee structures and uh, in a more formal way of, of, of projects and areas of interest. And I can think of a number of past presidents who are such, such polite people that they would not assert themselves. I, I wonder myself reflecting about a more organized way to, to formally get them involved by offering opportunities that I think could be an advantage to the society. Yeah. Perhaps we shouldn't call uh, them past presidents. I think inherent in that uh, terminology is uh, uh, some ending <laughs> of some, an era past that you, uh, you have reached the highest levels of the society and now you're done. Um, I, I think we should uh, perhaps call them uh, by a different name. Uh, I'm not sure what that name ought to be, but I think, uh, I think you're right. Uh, I think we do not fully tap into the available very senior talent. Uh, and I do think the society needs to think of ways to do that. So, final question. Tell us your vision of, uh, and you've tapped into it a bit, but of what you think the society, other than just numbers, will look like in a decade. Yeah. So I think the society will be a uh, much better known society around the world. I think the society will be uh, known as a proactive society. It will be known as a society that is available to interact in any area of the world to help with decreasing practice heterogeneity with decreasing global health inequity in the area of advanced heart and lung disease. That's my vision for the society, and I think that's where the society should be going and be recognized. So, Mandeep, you know, you've been the past president. You're one of only two people who have also been the editor. And myself and the society looks forward to many years of ongoing contributions from you when your time as editor is done. Yeah. So. We very much appreciate your taking time to share these thoughts with us for the historical archives of ISHLT. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for the opportunity.